Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Almighty God, to all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen.
Lord be with you. Let us pray. Grant us, O Lord, to trust in you with all our hearts, for as you always resist the proud who confide in their own strength, so you never forsake those who make their boast of your mercy. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from the book of Deuteronomy. See, I have set before you today life and prosperity, death and adversity. If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God that I am commanding you today by loving the Lord your God, walking in his ways, and observing his commandments, decrees, and ordinances, then you shall live and become numerous, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land that you are entering to possess. But if your heart turns away and you do not hear, but you are led astray to bow down to other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you shall perish. You shall not live long in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to enter and possess. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Choose life so that you and your descendants may live loving the Lord your God, obeying him and holding fast to him. For that means life to you and length of days so that you may live in the land the Lord swore to you and to your ancestors, to Abraham, Isaac, and to Jacob. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A reading from the letter of Paul to Philemon. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother. To Philemon, our dear friend and co-worker. To Aphia, our sister. To Archippus, our fellow soldier. And to the church, your house. Grace to you and peace from our God and our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. When I remember you in my prayers, I always thank God because I hear of your love for all of the saints and your faith towards the Lord Jesus. I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective when you perceive all the good that we may do for Christ. I have indeed received much joy and encouragement from your love because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you, my brother. 
For this reason, I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do your duty. Yet I would rather appeal to you on the basis of love. And I, Paul, do this as an old man and now also as a prisoner of Christ Jesus. I am appealing to you for my child, Onesimus, whose father I have become during my imprisonment. Formerly, he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful to both, both to you and to me. I am sending him, that is, my own heart, back to you. I wanted to keep him with me so that he might be of service to me in your place during my imprisonment for the gospel. But I preferred to do nothing without your consent in order that your good deed might be voluntary and not something forced. Perhaps this is the reason he was separated for you for a while, so that you might have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but as more than a slave, a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So if you consider me your partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. If he has wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will repay it. I say nothing about you owing me even your own self. Yes, brother, let me have this benefit from you and the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident in your obedience, I am writing to you, knowing that you will do even more than I say. The word of the Lord. Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Luke. Now large crowds were traveling with Jesus, and he turned and said to them, Whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and even life itself, cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. For which of you intended to build a tower does not first sit down and estimate the cost to see whether he has enough to complete it. Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it will begin to ridicule him saying, This fellow began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going out to wage war against another king, will not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to oppose the one who comes against him with 20,000? If he cannot, then while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks for the terms of peace. So therefore, 
None of you can become my disciple if you do not give up all your possessions. The Gospel of the Lord. Almighty God, whose most dear son went not up to joy, but first he suffered pain and entered not into glory before he was crucified. Mercifully grant that we, walking in the way of the cross, may find it none other than the way of life and peace, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus turned to the large crowds that were following him and said, Whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and even life itself cannot be my disciple. I'm sure that the large crowd recoiled a little bit when they heard Jesus say that. And I wouldn't be surprised if Peter or John quietly sidled up to him and said, Master, you feeling all right today? Hate our family? Really? Now, it's hyperbole, of course. Jesus doesn't actually want us to hate our mothers or fathers. Jesus doesn't call us to hate anyone. But we're being asked to do something that is similarly difficult. Jesus is saying that if we want to follow him, our primary, our soul devotion needs to line up with our jobs, not with our friends, not with our chosen political party, not with our self-interest, not even with our families, but with God and God made manifest in Christ Jesus. We are asked to turn our back on our worldly priorities so that we might turn towards Jesus. The fourth century church ritualized this change in direction in the baptismal liturgy. At that time, baptisms were only held once a year. They took place during that great vigil between Holy Saturday and Easter Day. Immediately before sunrise, the whole congregation would leave the building they had gathered in. They'd go outside, and the candidates for baptism would be examined. And they'd be examined while facing west into the dark of night. They would renounce those things that draw them from the love of God. And then they would turn around 180 degrees to face east. They would face the just barely dawning light of Easter day. And while facing that light, commit themselves to following Jesus. Literally, as the spiritual says, putting the world behind them and the cross of Christ before them. Jesus asks quite a lot from us when he asks us to follow him and to be his disciples. He asks everything of us. Discipleship calls for a devotion to Jesus and to the task of following him that is not just wholehearted but occupies the whole of our being. In calling us, Jesus asks us to make the incalculably costly decision to devote our whole selves to the project of following him. Jesus tells two parables in the wake of this difficult teaching, and those parables are actually a little out of step with the other parables that Jesus tells. We expect Jesus' parables to do the unexpected. We expect them to alter the way that we understand who God is, 
who we are in relationship to God or how the world works. But these two parables sound more like common sense wisdom than anything else. They're two simple stories posed as questions. Who among you doesn't estimate the cost of a project before starting out? The, the reasonable answer is no one. We all think about what it's going to cost before we start to do something. And what sort of leader doesn't see if there's any chance at all of victory before committing those in their charge to a battle? A really bad one, probably. It's common sense to do both, isn't it? The shocking twist in these stories is that God does act that way. God operates without counting the cost, operates without examining the odds. God didn't choose the most efficient way to redeem the world. There was no calculus around how many people could be saved with the use of the least amount of resources. God didn't sit down and make a compromise. Okay, I'll save 75% of all of humanity, and well, the other 25%, we can just write that off. No. God chose to redeem each and every last one of us, and chose to do so no matter the cost. God gave all of God's self the task of redeeming us, the task of bringing us to new and abundant life. And it is that God, the God who in Christ Jesus has given all by way of the cross for us, who asks us to give up all so that we can follow him. The move towards discipleship is one that's made without a complete accounting of the path that we'll take. The cost, on the other hand, is clear. Following Jesus costs us everything. In following Jesus, we present to him continually our whole selves, our souls and bodies. We know that to follow Jesus is to follow him into death. To follow Jesus is to take up our cross each and every morning. It is to join ourselves daily to the cross of Christ. But in all of this talk of the cost of discipleship, I think we've forgotten about the joys of discipleship. We've forgotten about the life of discipleship. We've forgotten about the innumerable benefits and abundant life that we find not just at the end of our earthly pilgrimage, but right this very instant. When we take up our cross and follow Jesus, our road does not end at Calvary. It leads all the way to Easter Day. And from the perspective of Easter Day, the cross ceases to be solely an instrument of death. When we take up our crosses daily, death is absolutely still involved. But in the light of the resurrection, it is death to self. Death to a life lived entirely on our own terms. Death to sin. But in that same cross, we find joy, we find peace, and we find life. My friends, Jesus has already taken up his cross for us. And because he has done so, we can take up our cross each day and follow him. He's already brought us from death and into life. In him, our death to the world is not an end, but an embrace, and a wholehearted one at that, of the life that has already been won for us.
many of those who were listening to Jesus that morning would soon learn the full meaning of what Jesus was teaching. Their lives were upended. Like countless others in the generations that have followed, upended by the simple invitation, follow me. The lives of two of those present that day, Peter and John, were set in verse by William Alexander Percy in 1924. Percy's poem has made its way into our hymnal. It's 661 if you want to take a look. The first three stanzas are about Peter and John, about their lives before and during their period of discipleship. The lives of two disciples who followed profoundly difficult paths. Percy writes, they cast their nets in Galilee just off the hills of brown. Such happy, simple fisher folk before the Lord came down. Contented, peaceful fishermen before they ever knew the peace of God that filled their hearts brimful and broke them too. Young John who trimmed the flapping sail, homeless in Patmos died. Peter who hauled the teeming net, head down was crucified. But it's the fourth and final stanza of Percy's poem that I want to draw our attention to this morning. Because it is an exhortation to all of us who answer Jesus' invitation to discipleship. The peace of God, it is no peace, but strife closed in the sod. Yet let us pray for but one thing, the marvelous peace of God. Jesus calls us to follow him, to follow him into places where he has already gone and where we will not walk alone. And while he calls us to follow him into death, he does so so that we might also follow and be brought by him into life. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he has worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray to the living God, saying, Hear our prayer. For the Church, for the Anglican Communion, and for Justin, Archbishop of Canterbury, for the Episcopal Church, and for Michael, our presiding bishop, for the Diocese of Pittsburgh, and for Ketlin, our bishop, for the Ministry of Calvary Church, for Cameron, as she begins her ministry at Calvary for all who want to follow Christ. Lead us and guide us, O Lord. Living God, in your mercy. 
for the leaders and people of the nations, for the people of Ukraine, Ethiopia, Yemen, Afghanistan, Myanmar, Pakistan, and all places devastated by war, disaster, and calamity. For those whose decisions affect the lives of others. For those who serve their country, particularly Christine, Wade, Trace, Robert, John, Chris, and George. For troops deployed in Eastern Europe, for their families, and for the safe return of those far from home. Help us to choose ways of life and not paths of death. Living God, in your mercy. For all laborers, for integrity and fulfillment in our work, for those in need of employment, for those who seek fair wages and safe conditions for all workers, for those whose work puts them in danger each day. Help us to remember that our common life depends upon each other's toil. Living God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all who suffer in body, mind, or spirit, for people infected with COVID-19 and for their loved ones, for strength for all health care workers, for Erica, Elise, Diane, Bob, Henry, Margaret, Stefan, Paula, Phyllis, Beverly, Oliver, Russell, Sang, Clive, Marjorie, Amy, Bruce, Anne, Jamie, Joan, Dorothy, Katie, Tammy, Aaron, Kelly, Carolyn, Don, Ruth, Scott, Marion, Beth, Carol, Peter, Lorraine, Pat, Alec, Kim, Ruth, Marianne, Paul, Doreen, and all those who have been commended to our prayers. For people throughout the world living with HIV and AIDS, for those struggling with addiction and those in recovery, for caregivers, for those whom we now name. Refresh their souls with your grace and peace. Living God, in your mercy. For those who have died. For Hazel Dixon. For those in whose memory altar flowers are given today. Jeff Reed. For victims of gun violence. For those who mourn. For those whom we now remember. Through Christ's cross and resurrection, raise them to new life in you. Living God, in your mercy. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. By what we have done, by what we have left undone, we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry when we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you, and also with you.
Good morning. Welcome to Calvary Church. It's great to have you all with us this morning, whether you're joining us here in person or online. If you are a guest or visiting with us this morning, a special welcome to you, and I'd invite you to take a visitor card out of the pew back in front of you, fill it out, and either drop it in an offering plate or hand it to one of the clergy following the service, and someone will be in touch with you this week to invite you out for a cup of coffee, to hear a little bit about what brought you through our doors this morning and answer any questions you might have about the ministry that goes on in this wonderful place place. Beginning on Saturday, September 10th, Calvary will be jointly hosting an art installation called Memorial to the Lost with East Liberty Presbyterian Church, Eastminster Church, and Valley View Presbyterian Church. It is a collection of about 60 unfortunately more than 60 at this point, t-shirts, each of which has the name of someone who has done by, died by gun violence in the last year. We'll be jointly hosting that between September 10th and September 21st. To kick off our hosting of this, there is a march that will start at Valley View Presbyterian Church on Saturday morning and move to each of the churches that is hosting this and conclude here at Calvary. I'd invite you, if you have time, to join for that march. Information about that is in the bulletin. The book sale has concluded, and I'm happy to report that we have raised more money with that this year than we have in any prior year. So that's a lot of money that's going to go out into the community to help support literacy programs in and around Pittsburgh. Thank you to all who donated books, who helped sort books, who worked at the book sale, or who came to the book sale and purchased books. You've done a lot of work to help people learn reading and all of the gifts that come from that. Formation for children begins next week and formation for adults begins in October. And you might think I've buried the lead here and I have a little bit. I want to welcome, and it's a delight to welcome, the Reverend Cameron Solis and her husband Michael. Cameron is our new associate rector. Please welcome her. Welcome. Uh, Cameron is a fantastic addition to our clergy team and will be overseeing our pastoral care ministries and young adult ministries. To more formally welcome her, please come back next Sunday. She'll be preaching. It'll be rally day. We'll have ministry fair, a ministry fair after the 9 o'clock liturgy and going pretty much through the afternoon. And we'll have a cookout, weather permitting, but food in any event after this liturgy information about what you might be able to bring is in the bulletin, and if you're planning to bring something, please let Kim in the parish office know. So join us next week for that, please. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us an offering and sacrifice to God.
The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. For by water and the Holy Spirit, you have made us a new people in Jesus Christ our Lord, to show forth your glory in all the world. Therefore, we praise you joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. We give thanks to you, O God, for the goodness and love which you made known to us in creation, and the calling of Israel to be your people, and your words spoken through the prophets, and above all, in the word made flesh, Jesus, your Son. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death, into life. On the night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, O Father, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory. And we offer a sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. You died us to your Son in his sacrifice, that we may be acceptable through him, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection unto your Christ, and bring us to that heavenly country where with all your saints we may enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters through Jesus Christ our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation. By him and with him and in him and the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now... As our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. the gifts of God for the people of God.
Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. Amen. The peace of God that passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of God's Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. The blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.